thinking about adultism again as of late, which is another one of these newer cyberspace only isms that's arguably unnecessary. And I can see people being tempted to lump it into the same pile of isms as I don't know, something like ableism. I know that's one prominent ism that people like to mock is ableism. But adultism hasn't quite made the rounds yet, despite being, like I said, another newishism that highlights discriminatory treatment and even discriminatory attitudes. All kinds of prejudicial stuff based on the convenience of overlooking individual variants within a group, different character traits, different psychographics across the category, or even across a cluster of similarly situated individuals. But instead of plain old ageism, which works both ways, um, of course, ageism encouraging the young to underestimate the old and the old to underestimate the young, adultism doesn't really do that because it's, it's purely a one-way street. So minors are seen as cognitively inferior to adults and I suppose decisionally inferior as well, just across the board, and are therefore under adult control more often than not. And it's justified. And of course, parents and guardians do nothing to earn that control over them, and no one bats an eyelid. The clearest example of unearned power, in effect, and ironically, is by far the most unquestioned form of unearned power, interpersonally speaking. And on balance, drawing attention to this sort of stuff is probably a good thing, mainly because of some inevitable spillover effects. But it's also not without its dangers. The moment detractors of adultism start going around using rhetoric like child freedom or child agency or child autonomy, we need to bring about child autonomy so that adults cannot act upon minors without their consent. You hear this sort of stuff every now and then on message boards discussing adultism in negative ways, and it's kind of cringeworthy. Or even the Stefan Molyneux strategy, which asserts that it is impermissible to initiate force against one's child or against any child as a means of disciplining them. The moment you use any of that as an argument, as many critics of adultism are happy to do, well, then it's all fairly black and white from there on out, isn't it? A kid is either autonomous or not autonomous. A kid is either subject to some level of parental forceful control or none. If the minor is declared an autonomous individual or sovereign individual, um, we're left with zero room for scalar judgments, to say nothing of scalar prescriptions or scalar proscriptions. So take a curfew or even a lax curfew, for example imposed by the parent or guardian, household autocrat, however the fuck you want to put it. Right? So we might say that um, it would have had to have been unjustified because it's involuntary and autonomy is the deal breaker. Even if you have a 12 year old who wishes to roam the streets of Harlem, wee hours of the morning, the moment you sign off on child autonomy as the moral baseline, and then turn around and start throwing caveats in there and other corner cases and outliers, that just comes across as special pleading. So, no, you, you can't appeal to things like child autonomy, just as you can't appeal to declarations like um, never ever initiate violence as a parent, never ever spank as a parent. It does zero, zero argumentative work for you and for all critics of adultism. You just run into intellectual black holes or strategic dead ends with these binary setups, these, these lazy setups. But that said, this doesn't weaken the, the, the spirit of the critique of adultism. It just makes it clear that you can't indulge post hoc rationales to come up with some non-discriminatory treatment of minors across all circumstances. You gotta leave room for discrimination and profiling both in treatment and in attitudes. This should be applied to all the other isms as well, by the way. All the other isms whose primary purpose is to disapprove of discrimination. You can't disapprove of discrimination in every fathomable, theoretical, or even commonplace scenario. You have to pick and choose 
when it makes sense to do so, and then reflect to see when it was indeed retrospectively justified versus when it wasn't. If you were a moral particularist and a uh, contextualist of some sort, discrimination cannot be completely off limits in all moral dilemmas, just as nothing else is off limits across all commonplace scenarios. Um, if you're living in a region that sees, let's say, um, above average crime rates, like some mafia riddled district in, I don't know, in Russia, let's say, well then, discriminating on the basis of what groups and neighborhoods and alleyways to avoid like the plague, that's just a survival procedure. But even if you're a Westerner and you are relatively, um, you're living in some sort of relatively peaceful, low crime region, but you've done your homework on what group commits what percent of crime and you uh, have come to find that there's a lopsidedness there, it's not split across all groups evenly, well then, discriminating on the basis of that information is perfectly reasonable if your goal is to avoid getting mugged, getting beaten, or worse, right? So it's kind of like sacrificing your queen during a chess match. Most of the time, you don't want to sacrifice the queen. The queen is your MVP, the most valuable and impactful tool for winning. And it makes no sense to surrender this tool as a rule of thumb. But to deny that there are clear-cut exceptions is moral madness. It depends on the configuration of the chess match, usually in terms of how desperate you are, but you don't even have to be desperate. Sometimes it's just the clearest path toward a checkmate to surrender the queen. So anyone telling you to never surrender your queen knows fuck all about chess. And I liken this to any political ideology or moral philosophy that would have us believe that discrimination and profiling ought to be verboten all the time. That belief would be consequentially disastrous and ruinous if everyone followed through on it. it it's not a good conviction to have. So it's sanctimoniously um, beneficial, but practically it's horrific. So no sacred cows, whether ethically Politically, personally, no sacred cows. Applied even to isms, railing against presumptive attitudes about certain groups. In this case, the group being the youth. Okay? But does that mean that the extent to which minors are discriminated against today is, on balance, beneficial to them ultimately? Or is it, on balance, harmful to them ultimately? So that's the crux of this topic. And that's not how it's set up by people who critique adultism, but I think that is how it does need to be set up, which is why I'm setting it up the way I'm setting it up. Um, and once you've got it set up that way, I think the answer is less obvious across the West because, first of all, there are no studies asking young adults or even middle-aged adults, hey, are you retrospectively thankful that your parents micromanaged you throughout your youth? Or would you have preferred to have spent more or most of your free time however the fuck you would have pleased back then? However you would have chosen to spend it in your youth. You don't see those kinds of surveys. Not professionally, anyway. Like actual bulletproof methodologies and proper statistical models. So the overall harm-to-benefit ratio is not easy to pin down in the West. But I do think the ratio is blatantly obvious across Asia, across the Far East, and it points to a prescription for less disciplinarianism, less tiger mom syndrome, less helicopter parenting, and much more permissivism. And remember, it's always on an axis, the two extremes, and everything in between. The, the, the spectrum between disciplinarianism and permissivism. Now, these kids, these, these students in the Far East, the youth, they're offing themselves increasingly, and it's all down to extreme stress. At least most of it's down to extreme stress. It's because they've had it spun into their heads from, probably from toddlerhood, that academic performance and scholastic triumphalism is the most important thing in the world, and that 
lower test scores entail destitution and shame or some other, some other grave personal shortcoming. And that's just funny to me because over here, employers don't care. An employer who pays you six figures might care more often than not, but why the presumption that it has to be a six-figure salary and that if it's anything less than six figures, it's a dismal salary resulting in paycheck-to-paycheck -paycheck lifestyles, borderline poverty lifestyles. Another classic, fallacy of the excluded middle. That setup presented in that way contradicts every last bit of life experience I have and life experience of most of the individuals and peers I grew up with and, and know to this day. They didn't give a flying fuck about schooling. They gave somewhat of a fuck about education. Some of them did. But schooling? Get the fuck out of here, okay? And of course, schooling and education by no means overlap in some neat and tidy sense. And I may have just butchered a Mark Twain quote there. I know there's a Twain quote floating about the internet the, regarding the differences between education and schooling. And to this day, the two remain separate. They're not exactly joined at the hip, and even less so today because so much valuable content and information is readily available at your fingertips. It's just they won't let autodidacts take exams. Why won't they let autodidacts take exams? Because they want the exam taker to blow away tens of thousands of dollars on their tuition scans. So education and schooling only intersect insofar as you believe from early on that you are destined to be a careerist. Now, some of us are careerists and ladder climbers, and some of us are not. Many of us are what I would dub career apatheists, and there's nothing objectively worse about that, just as there's nothing objectively better about it. And that poses quite the pickle for the careerist parent, or the careerist guardian, who makes it the cornerstone of his parented formula to inculcate into the kid this, 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 this vulgar work hard, play hard value system that he has, either because he's had it inculcated into him or because he's come around to it free of indoctrination at some point during his life. It's, it's a pickle because what it does is, from the outset, we have an assumption that indiscretion in the kid gives the adult the green light to do away with the possibility of an incompatible value clash, something like low time preference versus high time preference. That's just irreconcilable, and there's no way to resolve it. Some individuals have low time preferences, others have high time preferences. If you believe that one is objectively worse than the other, you are deluded. Now, I know that from very early on, I just knew right off the bat, I was not going to grow up and convert my value system into ladder climbing and careerism 101. I knew I would always be a career apatheist and that this would suit me just fine and that I didn't have to work hard because I had no intentions of being reckless and playing hard. I was easy to entertain. I'm generally risk averse, fail safe, so satiable as well. So, so apathyism, when it comes to careers, there's just no bones about it. It's, it's a slam dunk, personally speaking. Hasn't even mildly inconvenienced me as an adult. Now, I could have probably been somewhat of a more efficient, effective altruist had I sacrificed leisure time on having six-figure incomes. And I'm sure that there are some ultra-strict altruists out there who would say that my not having done so is not only prescriptively worse, it's not only a prescriptive negative, it's an injunctive negative, or a proscriptive negative. So, so there's a difference there between a prescription and an injunction. So it's not just prescriptively worse for the world, but it's morally impermissible for myself to fail. And that's their analysis, that's fine, I suppose. It's an interesting debate. Maybe with enough philosophical maneuvering, you can even sneak the maximum principle in there. Give it a shot. See what happens. Um, but I maintain that sidestepping careers and, and high earnings and ladder climbing is spot on for a certain personality type and a certain psychological profile. 
and the older I get, the more strengthened that bit of intrapersonal forecasting becomes. So scholastic micromanagement, this, this presumptive notion, that, um, that this, this agenda that's disgustingly prevalent in the Far East, um, that's one reason, a huge reason why I don't just laugh off the term adultism the way I imagine many people would had adultism been as popular as the term ableism. So I don't dismiss these strident critics of adultism. Granted, there are newisms kind of like it that should be dismissed and mocked. It just so happens that this is not one of them. There is legitimate conceptual work to be done here. Some real arguments to be had. We all have object level goals, which is to say we all have nearsighted goals. And we have meta level goals, by which I mean farsighted goals. And the progression doesn't stop at age 18 or age 28 or age 38 or even age 68. But the presumption is, at least going by Western modernity, the presumption says adultists and, and, and adultist style micromanagement is impermissible at 38. It's impermissible at 28, but at 18 and below, all systems go. So, very flimsy standards here. Very flimsy. A bit, bit, bit of special pleading going on. And if it wasn't for the premise that the object level preference of the non-adult will one day go on to be a perfect match for the parent meta level preference, the two will merge, even though it's oppositional between the child and the parent in the current object level framework. So if it wasn't for that presumptive arrogance and hubris, that it's, it's just gonna synthesize down the road, many people's youths would have been much more fulfilling. And that's never brought up. And the truly insidious part of all this is that when things are good, when we find the things most interesting that we find is when they're at their most fresh, when they're at their most novel to us which mostly occurs during one's youth. The older you get, the harder it is to be impressed by just about anything, especially if you're a non-stop analytical thinker, which, guilty. Um, you can still be impressed by things in a detached sort of way, but that attached mode of being impressed, that's mostly training wheels coming off, and that feeling of cycling without the training wheels for the very first time. So I think we need to safeguard, um, we need some sort of societal safeguard that treasures the free time youth have not to make excuses for parents who are careerists and who believe it's just another version of them and their values that they're molding by restricting free time of other individuals who have to live in their households through no choice of their own. And oftentimes, it's not even in the interest of familial pride and legacy or anything like that. It can also be this um, inane yearning for something like national economic supremacy. And I'd love it if someone showed up here and engaged in apologetics for that. I mean, talk about instrumentalizing other individuals. That's next level instrumentalization of other individuals. And for what? What? Study around the clock because what? Our nation has to economically outperform these other few nations. But why? Why not just focus on doing better for yourself and for your own generation without indulging all these international comparisons? The quest to be number one. Not the quest to do better for yourself right now by, for instance, deficit spending less but the quest for your nation to be number one down the road, even after you've croaked. That, that's supposed to be a left-wing weakness, last I checked. Always worrying about those people over there who have it better than you. People who've done really well for themselves, way better than they probably deserved in any system that's not rigged against the poor, which of course gets into accusations of envy probably some truth to those accusations. And I've always found it funny that people of a left-wing bent, and I mean left 
in the broadest sense of the term. Um, funny that they get all sorts of flack from the right, the, the right, listen to me, I'm being a pundit over here, I should be ashamed of myself, um, but, but they do, and it's for obsessing over the existence of classes and, and uh, income inequality being in and of itself a bad thing, not income inequity, but inequality per se. But the same critique can be levied at nativists, jingoists, perhaps some hardcore nationalists who obsess over their nation's ranking in the grand scheme of things. And it always boils down to a comparative analysis, which is vulnerable to things like the leveling down objection, right? Whether it's for individuals or for nations, the leveling down objection applies. If America is number one, not because America improved in any way, but because its chief competitive nations worsened, then America is no better or worse than it was before it became number one. It might be in a better bargaining position right now, but then that counterpoint fits just as perfectly if it applies to um, the sort of leveling down objection that only looks at individuals. Purely economic egalitarianism for individuals. The, the, the proletariat, if I may. Um, wipe out monetary inequality without making a single person richer in the slightest. Wipe it out by making everyone worse off, except those who were already really badly off, fiscally speaking. It's possible to do so, and many poor people and middle class people even will find themselves with more bargaining leverage if that happens. Doesn't mean it makes any sense to do so. Leveling down objection applies. So if envy is bad, then the badness of envy, in terms of being jealous of others, whether it's on a national level or a personal level, it has to be indistinguishable. So that's another strike against the obsession to be a careerist in order to make your nation number one, as opposed to simply to better yourself in accordance to your own idiosyncratic work hard, play hard values, which not everyone shares. So, ties back to adultism. Even if I point to the worst example of helicopter parenting throughout much of Asia, like the Tiger Mom, none of this is grounds for controversy in the landscape here in the West. Most Westerners draw this conventional line at domestic corporal punishment and they never look back. And this leaves other forms of parent-child subjugation and, and other, power play other power play dynamics in the home to remain without a bit of inspection. So real pushback against this entails frank, unapologetic criticisms of willful initiations, the, the, the very circumstance that calls for the catch-22 involving one individual making decision for another individual. This is the only way to truly stamp out the need for vulnerable minors having guardians and stewards and for adultism itself. But what you'll find is that detractors of adultism don't seem all that interested in targeting the source of this problem, refusing to birth the next round of fragile minors that seems like the most straightforward remedy for the problems of minors being unjustly controlled. Controlled by people who did nothing to earn that control over them. Any other remedy you inject will be subject to guesswork. Bring in minors into uncertain states of affairs to begin with. You just put a stamp of approval on inevitable moral dilemmas by having to either subjugate them or neglect them during their upbringing. If you could simply bring full-fledged adults into existence, that'd be a different story, but you can't. And these are very difficult trade-offs. Uncertainty is built into the project, so I don't want to hear how, oh, well, tough decisions have to be made. Yes, they do. They, they have to be made after one foot has already been placed in the quicksand, you 
may end up lucky and get that foot out, but why put the foot in there to begin with? So adultism can only retrospectively be a lesser of evil's approach if these controlled individuals thank their parents post-adolescence or further down the road whenever brain development wraps up and when they're of sound mind or something resembling sound-mindedness. And likewise, neglect would retrospectively be a lesser of evil's approach should the neglected individuals thank their parents for it when their true shrewd judgment really sets in. Though arguably shrewd judgment is always a work in progress throughout one's entire life, but then you also have minors who are precocious. Kids who, while still vulnerable on a financial level and a physical level, um, they're still the sort of minors who are done a huge service by being afforded enough leeway to do as they please, despite being allowed to live under their parents' roof, free of charge. But then, another schism arises out of the fact that not everyone shares the same criteria for what constitutes a precocious minor. So, um, that's, that's a pickle and a half. And there's pickle after pickle after pickle when it comes to this. I thought I qualified as a precocious minor, but people laughed it off because they used report cards as a metric to determine things of that sort. And, um, it's, it's shameful. So given these dilemmas and the inescapability of them, if the options come down to A, control the child, B, neglect the child, C, some healthy combination between controlling and neglecting a child, then a strong case can easily be made that tacking on a fourth, none of the above choice, makes the best of an otherwise unnecessarily dicey situation. And the only way for none of the above to register as option B is through the unwillingness to initiate biological parenthood. And I will apply that even to non-biological parenthood, like adoption. If you are considering adopting and you're in the West, you'll be subject to the same catch-22 dilemmas. Not to mention that raising a child from infancy to age 18 costs, on average, 227 grand and I'll link that in the description. And that's actually a conservative estimate. Um, so it's, if instead of adopting, imagine you poured that 227 grand to effective altruist interventions. You will have helped far more individuals than some Western orphan because your dollar would have gone a longer way, much longer way, in those other impoverished regions. Plus no headaches for you and no turmoil within the household. You get more peace of mind, and you actually reduce more harm across more individuals. There's no such thing as a catch-all formula for successful parenthood. Notions of sensible parenting and, and, and attempts to get at this, this authentic stewardship of youth. All those things always rest on the shaky ground, inferring that the parent, and the child, will end up with compatible enough outlooks on life once adulthood rolls around. But worldviews are not heritable, so this amounts to nothing more than some sort of rosy hope, which points to a lack of clear-cut justification behind the deliberate initiation of very difficult circumstance calling for A, control, B, neglect, C, some healthy balance thereof, while ruling out D. And, of course, you have natalism as the overriding ideological currency, keeping option D, none of the above, keeping that plea option from rearing its head on a wide enough scale. And the reason people overlook every aspect of this discussion, especially throughout Asia, is due to the naive view of children as mere extensions of their parents, which I like to call familial essentialism. Um, just look at the widespread acceptance of terminological absurdities like Muslim child or Christian child, and you look back throughout the Cold War, you had something similar. The same assumption was happily extended to capitalist children, communist children. Not children of capitalist or children of communists. No, no, no. Capitalist child. Communist child. 
those born in capitalistic regions were immediately presumed to be believers of capitalism, considered one more for the home team, and ditto for those born in communistic regions. The assumption that parents, by procreating, are playing some game of extend yourself, that's still entrenched. And most thinkers, especially Western thinkers, who pay lip service to the wonders of individualism, but clearly they are yet to internalize individualistic values when we turn our attention to the household. So, am I trying to destroy the family unit with this? No. There's a difference between destruction and aversion, or avoidance. Once the familial project is underway, mistakenly, yeah, then apply your best guesswork. And don't fail. Don't abandon ship. But don't pretend you're doing something else. Don't pretend there's a catch-all formula for success. Projecting your sensibilities and values and psychographics onto this other person. It doesn't make for a successful formula. And that should be uncontroversial, but it's not. And I will probably get some, what is the cliche thing that people always trot out? The, um, just the knee-jerk response whenever this sort of stuff comes up. The, the, the who are you to tell me how to raise my child? And I can't believe I still see that cropping up every now and then. It's just beyond thoughtless and lame. That line of thinking is precisely why domestic corporal punishment only started being phased out legally within the last century last few decades to be precise. It's why um, we didn't have child protective services for most of our civilizational run. And it's probably why many wacky Muslim majority countries still don't have CPS, child protective services. Who are we to tell them they mustn't honor kill or genitally mutilate or arrange forced marriages between their kids? And I can just go down the list who are we to tell them that? Well, I'll tell you who we are. We are thinkers, and we are certainly not cultural relativists. So, who are they to tell us we can't tell them that? Or better yet, who wants to know? If I may quote Hitchens' response to who are you type question, who the fuck wants to know? It never ends. And it's funny because people like, uh, what is his name, uh, Paul Joseph Watson and his fellow info warriors and that whole corner of the internet, the, the, the conspiratorial black holes, people mired in conspiracy theory from A to fucking Z, they, they're very much against things like Islam, but their views on how kids belong solely to their parents and to no one else, that maps on perfectly to how Muslim maniacs see it. And I've always thought that was rather cute. He's supposed to be the polar opposite. That's how he paints himself, him and Jones and the rest of them. How their whole tribe paints themselves as the polar opposites of this lunacy. And yet, much of that in terms of familial sacrosanctness and, and tightness is perfectly compatible. So, yeah, and 